All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, this is to a, uh, another episode of the Dad at Arms channel, the Dad at Arms podcast. I am your host, Dad at Arms. I also go by Colt. And with me today is a really, really fun guest. It is my friend, Ted Biaselli. Hi, Ted. Why, good morning, my friend. How are you? I am doing great. I'm so happy that we're doing this today. Bright um, sunny morning. I love it. I love yeah. this nice chat. We're going to talk about toys. And oh, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, <laughs> before we get started, I just wanted to say that your shirt looks really nice today. Yeah, thanks. Nice shirt. Um, yeah, look uh, at that. that. Cool. If, you, if, you, if you're in the, uh, the Amazon Revelation uh, t-shirt club, this was this month's uh, t-shirt. I was very excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to wear that on, on Colt's cast. Yeah. Um, lovely artwork by the badass Eamon O'Donohue, who we just adore. He's awesome. He's so good. He's such a good dude, too. I just love mm -hmm. that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And all the artwork he does. I mean, all the artists that are doing, you know, their art for the Massiverse line and the Origins line. I mean, they're killing it. Honestly, it is it is such a highlight to see toys embracing artwork in the mm -hmm. packaging and all that stuff. I mean, it's not just Mattel, too, like Hasbro on the G.I. Joe uh, classified line. Man, that artwork is freaking great like every package is and what i love is it's such a variety of artwork and same th same thing with the masterverse like there's so many great people who have legacy like like nate and eamon and and then new new people that that i'm like wow who did that that's really great too like just beautiful artwork and then on origins all the the stuff by um axel and francisco look like just whoa, so yeah. good so good. I literally just have i got my my frog monger the other day and i got this like look at this card art Look it's at so that good. coming up out of the out of the the pit, man. I just love it so much. Well, and then we've got the uh, what was it with? I've got it right back here. It's that the trifold artwork that they did for uh, Camelcon. Yep. Hold hold on a second. My 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 dogs are going nuts. Sure, 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 sure. I have, I have two dogs. I have a husky and a lab named Phoenix and Storm. Um, mm. And they sit, I have this big, big picture window on the second floor and they just sit there and they, every dog that walks by, I have, I have an announcement that there is a dog in front <laughs> of your house and it is not <laughs> me. <laughs> That's awesome. We just got a, uh, my wife found a new dog for me like two weeks ago an australian shepherd <gasps> um his name is his name is gus so we rehomed him someone she worked with had him and, and wasn't able to take care of him and she's like you know i was still i was to the point you know i i lost link over the summer my uh, beagle that right. i had and that was awful but uh i was to the point where i was like you know i think i'm done with dogs i don't I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to deal with that again. And then she's like, no, you need another dog. You're a farmer. You need somebody out there hanging out with you while you're doing your work and stuff like that. And so she brought him home and my boys just love him. They're always bringing him in the house and letting and him lay on the couch with him. Too. What, a, what a great dog. Both of my yeah. dogs, Phoenix, uh, the Husky, she was a wee home. And then the lab was rescued from Puppy Mills. Um, and uh, my my beagle that I had before, um, mm -hmm. we Dude, as well, my beagle Shazam that I had for 12 Aww. years. It was 12 great. Years. Great dog. One, yeah. of, one of my favorite dogs in my entire life. I love that dog. But I'm I'm getting like puppy pains. Like, you know how you know how some some yeah. women in their like 40s they get like mother pains? I'm getting yep. puppy pains. I'm like, <laughs> you need another puppy. Soon. Need that puppy. <laughs> and they're so fun too. I like this time of year because you know. Spring comes in, animals start having like our farm animals and stuff start having their their babies. So we get like baby calves and baby horses that are coming along, and and we just got a bunch of new baby chicks, um, out in the chicken coop, and so it, it's it's a fun time of year. Awesome, I love it. So let's start talking about some stuff, Ed. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce who you are and um. Uh, I'm Ted Biaselli. Uh, I am. Uh, I currently work for Netflix uh, in their original series team. I do. I oversee what we call our spectacle series. Those tend to be big, 
um, expensive shows, usually with a big piece of IP, big filmmakers attached to it. So recently I did Wednesday, um, working on the live action One Piece, uh, and then um, also did Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. Those are just like the ones that I'm currently uh, currently working on. And then um, also while I was there, um, was able to make Masters of the Universe Revelation happen, uh, which was really exciting and bridge the the relationship between Mattel and Netflix. So that was very awesome. exciting. Uh, before Netflix, I was at um, Hasbro's TV network here in the United States. We had a, a short-lived television network called The Hub. I oversaw Transformers Prime, G.I. Joe Renegades, Littlest Pet Shop, R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour, The Aquabat Super Show, a lot of fun stuff uh, over there. We did a mini series based on Clue, which was really fun. And then before that, I was at Disney for nine years uh, in oh, their wow. animation development uh, at the Disney Channel. So Awesome. So you've got a, a nice storied career. Yep, both live action and animation. Um, I've been very blessed in my career. I've been able to, to touch a lot of brands that matter to me. Um, at Netflix, you know, I worked on Transformers War for Cybertron as well as Master of the Universe Revelation. Um, worked on The Dark Crystal, uh, Age of Resistance, which was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Um, and then, you know, now working on One Piece, which is really, really expansive and crazy and so much fun and um I'm re i really can't wait for people to see that show it's so special i love it awesome awesome um with uh with your you know with uh the revelation stuff and and like you said bridging that gap between mattel and netflix and to bring masses of the universe you know kind of back with with new projects and stuff like that how did all of that kind of start what was the kind of the a brief timeline story behind that it's it's a funny story, by the way. It's it's a good story. I was at because I've been I've been a Motu fan my entire life. It's my number one. Like you know, yeah. some some people Star Wars is their number one, or Batman's their number one, or whatever. Motu's always been my number one, and um, I've been on HeMan.org since the beginning. In fact, I, I you know I've known Eamon that long. I have a picture of us. I think from maybe like the very first power party we used to have in San Diego with all the people from HeMan.org. Um, with me and uh, Val and Emiliano and all, all of all of the, the the you know the old OG old He Man fans um, and you know I've always I've always loved the brand and I would go to all the different events especially in person at San Diego and I went to one of the when Super Seven got the license I went to okay. they had a little, they had a party. And I, I had met um, Rob David there and he was over, he was overseeing the, you know, the story department. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had known a lot of different people at Mattel over the years. This guy, Rob Hudnut, who was in charge of all of Mattel's sort of um, enter entertainment endeavors. Um, when I, surprisingly enough, when I worked for Hasbro's TV network, the first call that I made was to Mattel to see about getting a Masters of the Universe show on this network. And of course, for every reason that you would imagine, that never happened. But <laughs> the idea of being able to create Transformers, G.I. Joe, and He-Man on the same, you know, place for, like, that's where I grew up. I grew up with those shows all living yeah. together. I wanted to do that again as, as an adult, being able to create sort, sort of that nostalgic place. But so I had met Rob and, and, and we just hit it off and we said, you know, let's, you know, let's just get together and hang out. And we had this, we had a great breakfast together and we talked about like, what, what would you want to see? What would you want to see if you made, you know, a, a modern, a modern He-Man show? And, you know, I said to him, I said, here's what, here's what I would want. I wouldn't want to reinvent the world. I don't want to start over. I don't want to tell Adam's origin. I don't want to do any, any of that stuff. I'd actually really like to go back and just keep the stories going as if they never stopped. Right. And I was very influenced of course, by filmation, but also by the mini comics, also by the star comics. I love the star comics, the DC, you know, limited series. I love the golden books, you mm -hmm. know, remember those, but I loved all the golden books. There was a, an album that I had, um, kid stuff records did this album of like the, the origins of masters of the universe it was, it was one of my favorite things when I was a kid, like all that stuff was really, really like, that's my foundation for Motu. I know some people it's just the mini comics or it's just filmation. I was kind of like, 
all encompassing. And I said to Rob, I said, can we just like, just, keep the story going as if, as if all that stuff ha happened and then mm -hmm. just the pieces. And then, and I said to him, I asked him a question. I said, who do you think Tila's father is? And he looked at me and he says, I think it's man at arms. And I said, I think it's man at arms too. Why wouldn't it be man at arms? And then I said to him, why would they keep that a secret? And he said, well, I think they would have kept it a secret from Tila because at some point she's going to have to detach from all of the people in her life and give herself over to her destiny. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and it may be easier for her if she didn't think that her father was her real father, but someone who took her in. And okay. that may be an easier detachment for her. And I thought that was really profound when he said that. I was like, wow, that's really, really smart. And then we started to sort of like, talk about like, well, what was your favorite episode of, of Filmation? And I said, you know, Teal's Quest. Like instantaneously, without, without even blinking, I was like, the moment when I saw that episode and I heard that Teal was the sorceress's daughter was like, oh my God, Luke, I am your father. It was that kind, <laughs> that kind of moment for me. And, and I thought, what a, what a fabulous sort of like arc for this character to go on. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not talking out of school, the Tila in that show was not ready to be the sorceress. She was, right, right. She was impertinent. She was, you know, kind of, she was kind of rude. She was kind of, you know, she was a bit of a bully to Prince Adam. She, she, on many occasions, she disobeyed her father. She would do whatever she wanted. And I was like, that, that girl not ready to be the sorceress. <laughs> so but like, what a great arc for, for that character to sort of go on. Right. So that was, that was mine. I think Rob said problem with power. I think he, you know, we always loved sort of like this, what it really means to have the mantle of He-Man. What is, what is that? Why Adam? Why? It, it, it's got to be more than just, you know, birthright. Right. I think there has to be more to it than that. Like I'm sure. And, and truthfully, I mean, if you, if you know the, the legends, there are other, you know, legacy characters within the, the lineage that may not be, have been right to have owned He-Man, you know, the, the power of He-Man. But mm -hmm. I think fascinating that there that there was a reason why adam was was chosen and 2000 x it wasn't clear in 2000 x why adam was chosen but it was very clear that he was chosen to be he-man and that you know luring him to grayskull to give him the sword and all of that that was all part of a plan Right. And I think that that was that was really intriguing to me. And I, I think we wanted to sort of like split the difference. Right. We filmation never, never told an origin of He-Man. Right. And 2000s origin was inspired by some of the mini comics, but largely its own creation, which was very good, by the way. Yeah. Um, and I think that there was a, a really great sort of epic tale in in Adam's origin. But I think what we wanted to do was kind of split the difference between the legacy, you are part of a lineage, but you are the special one in the lineage. And I think that one that's sort of where we we came to. And we just had this like romantic conversation about the things we loved about the mini comics and about the, you know, the the, the movie even. Like the things I, I I made this comment, it got me in trouble a little bit. Uh I do things a lot like that. <laughs> I discounted a modern character that was made. I'm like, you know, nobody cares about that character now because that character is new. You're, you're introducing a new character into a, into a franchise. But that's kind of how I felt when I was a kid at the Masters of the Universe movie. And I, I said that. Mm -hmm. I was like, Gwildor, Blade, Sorod, you know, who are the hell are these people? Where's Orko? Where's, where's you know, Triclops? Where's Trapjaw? Those are the characters that I want to see. And these new characters that you're pushing in my face, they don't mean anything to me. Right. Cut to <laughs> 30 <laughs> years later, and we throw Blade in in the and Pig Boy in Revelation. And people are like, oh my God, it's Blade. <laughs> There's a nostalgia. And you know, it may not have been what you wanted when you were a kid, but as an adult, now now they hold a, a special place for you. Time has a way of of, you know, the movie was not like people were like, This isn't He-Man. I don't, I don't recognize it. It's not the things that I that I knew. And time has sort of made it made a place for it right mm -hmm. and, yeah. and those things like you know like like 
Skeletor's look and Frank Langella's performance and all of those things, we now hold a special place in our hearts for them. And I thought that that's, you know, we needed to make a little space for that in Revelation too. And, and it's all part of that, that sort of like love letter to that era. All things included, the movie, the cartoon, the, the miniseries, uh, the, you know, the miniseries comic, all of that stuff. Like those kinds of things were, were what we wanted to do. And then Rob said to me, you know, because I had done Castlevania as, as well. And Rob said, do you think that there's a world where we could do like a like a Castlevania type show with Masters of the Universe? Well, I kind of just like I was like. Oh my God. Yes. I'm, I'm at that place. I, <laughs> that's crazy. And, and I, and I, I was like, Oh my goodness. And I said, like, you know, we need somebody like Warren Ellis who wrote Castlevania and who also wrote, by the way, G.I. Joe Resolute, which in a lot of ways okay. is a predecessor to sort of like what we did with Revelation, like G.I. Joe Resolute, killed characters took everybody on a dark you know dark ver version of it it felt like like the the you know adult version of an episode of the of the old cartoon like that was kind of like what we what we had in mind for this and 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 we we used jojo resolute as well as castlevania as sort of like a template and and i coincidentally had lunch planned at comic-con with brad graber who runs powerhouse animation um okay. And we're, we're old buddies and, and we, and we like to get together at Comic-Con and, and I said to him and I said, would you guys be interested in doing a masters of the universe show? And Brad was like, what? <laughs> and within, within a day, within a day, he sent me like some sketches uh, from one of his animators there of like what a what a modern he-man and skeletor like more more barbarian looking would be and and I took those those pieces of artwork and I went to um, uh, one of my colleagues at Netflix who was running the animation team and I said are you are you interested in doing like a like a big limited series of masters of the universe you know, with powerhouse and doing something a little, a little edgier somewhere, somewhere between, you know, something for kids in Castlevania. And he was like, absolutely. And I was like, really? He's like, yep, yeah, let's get, let's make it. And that was it. And that was it. And then Rob, Rob went back to Mattel and, and mm -hmm. had, had to do it on their side. It's like, okay, so look, here's the thing. There's, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to do He-Man, but it, we're not, and, and, you know, when it's a, when it's a, a, a toy, it, it, it is a toy, right? We have to be honest. This is, this yeah. is, for kids um doing something like that is a little risky right i mean yes there is a large fan community yes there is a lot of adults but you don't want to alienate kids and sure. they had been working on the idea of a kid's re reinvention of, of motu and at that point i had introduced rob to our kids division and i said look we're going to be doing this thing for sort of like the you know people like me like the you know 40 year old nerds i said but if you guys are interested in, in reinventing Motu for, for a kid's audience, like you guys should talk. And they did. And they eventually made the, the kid show. And it was, it was kind of big strategic for Mattel to do, you know, here's, a, here's the thing that we're doing for the adults. And here's the thing, the, the reinvention, because we knew that, that the kids version is going to be more of a departure uh, from sort of like the, the yeah. root Motu. It, it was going to, it was going to reboot the, the, the origin and, and, a lot of stuff and, and, you know, and there's a risk to alienating the people who grew up on it. So mm -hmm. one of those split the difference kind of things. And and fortunately Netflix was like, yeah, let's do both. That's awesome. That is, that that's a fun story. Um, man, just to be able to, as a fan, I'm jealous just thinking about the idea of just sitting around talking about all these ideas of what you want to see and what you want to want to do. Oh, well, that was, um, just that was just between Rob and I, and then yeah. right when we said, okay, well, we need somebody to sort of spearhead this, somebody like a Warren Ellis. And Rob called me up and he said, "What do you think of Kevin Smith?" And I was like, "I love Kevin Smith." I was like, "I've seen every one of his movies." I said, "I love his run on Green Arrow. It's like yeah. it's one of my all time favorites. It's it's amazing." And I said, "Would he would he want to do something like this?" And he was like, "We should meet with him." And I met with him, and I said to him in the meeting, "It was first of all, it was just fun to meet with Kevin Smith." Yeah. Um, I actually have a copy of Chasing Amy on VHS that he signed for me when I went to see him when I was in college. 
That's um, awesome. And and I and we, we just we nerded out because he's from Jersey, I'm from Philly. We had a lot of you know a lot of overlap and um, and in the, in the meeting I said, look, I said here's what I here's what I don't want. I don't want I don't want it to be the you know the internet meme of you know Adam and you know hey, hey. right like, right it's not it's not that it's not that I said there is a there is a campiness to sure. to, to the filmation series was there was a lot of puns there was a lot of winks and nods I, we don't want to we don't want to minimize that we, but we we don't want to it it doesn't dominate the tone of this i said what i what i think that people miss about masters of the universe is that these there is a big lore here that has never truly been explored in content in media it's always been boiled down to you know muscle guys beating each other up and it's more mm-hmm. than there is there's arguably some of the best sort of science fiction and fantasy mashup mythology like on par with you know Robert E. Howard and Tolkien and and you know Jordan like there's like these are great great fantasy elements at play that no one has ever sort of really presented in a sophisticated way because it's a toy because it's it's made for for sort of you know it's made to be a plaything but i think that all the creators who were involved in this all of the people who built masters of the universe right don glute rob lamb you know tom tataranowitz like all of these people that lent their their words larry houston all these people that lent their words to building this world laid the foundation they were all inspired by by great writers. I mean, Larry Dottilio was so inspired by Lovecraft. It's it's in almost every one of his greatest episodes. There is a Lovecraftian element to it. There is so why why wouldn't we take advantage of all of those inspirations and present something in a really fascinating and sort of complex way? And that was that was really what the intention was. And when I said that to Kevin, I said, "Look, do me a favor. Just treat it like Shakespeare." I want, I want drama. I want pain. I want pathos. I want humor, but I also want to make these characters earn their achievements. I don't want it to come easy for any of them. I said, I think that, I think we have to earn it. And I said, and we talked about, you know, what is, what is sort of the, the, the arc of the story. I said, well, what we, what we've never seen are sort of the answers to the questions that have been asked of us as Motu fans. Like, Mm -hmm. will we, ever see Tila find out that Adam is He-Man? Will we ever see Tila ascend to become the sorceress? Will Skeletor ever take over Castle Grayskull? What does that do to him? Will Evil Lynn ever truly betray Skeletor? Like all of those things that that the original series and the comics and all that, those, those seeds that were all planted, we, you know, we wanted to, to play with those. We wanted to play with those questions and find answers. And a lot of what happened was one question that was being answered led the way to another question that was being answered and led to something. And and we kept building it out. And the writer's room was assembled by people who also love Motu. When you have Eric Carrasco, who arguably knew, you know, the show better than me, like he's, I mean, like he's a hardcore fan. He knew the show intimately and knew, you know, the stuff. And Tim, who came at it from a very, very different point of view, Kim, Tim really came at it from a literary point of view. He, okay. he saw all of these characters as multi multifaceted and layered. And Dia, Dia very much had a point of view about how, how to add a, a new layer into this and where, where the story could go, which is another thing. We we wanted to sort of make these ten episodes feel like a like a like a movie, right? Mm-hmm. And we wanted these characters to go on a, a journey, and that they would get to a place at the end of the journey where they were they were changed enough, but by the end of the thing, it was still Motu. It was still the thing that you knew, but but the story could go in a, in a new level, and that's that's kind of what we won, and. And Dia had a really good idea for that, and um, and we and and Mark Mark Bernardin came in and 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 brought a really fresh you know sense of fun. Like Mark really brought some fun. And Kevin, you know, he had never run a writer's room. He always wrote himself, and he you know he really just had a 
blast building with all of these people, these nerds. And we would do it in Kevin's living room. Um, and it's really rare for like the, the network executive to be a part of the writer's room conversations. But Rob and I were both in there and we were both spitting ideas out. We were both taking it there. And it was, it was really like, it reminded me of one of those, you know, late nights at PowerCon where we would all be sitting around in the lobby of the, you know, and the Torrance uh, Hilton and, you know, just talking, talking about the things that we love and the stories that we want to see. And what would you do if you could do this? And where would you take it? And, and all those things. And it was, it was a, a love letter. I mean, when we say that it was a love letter, we really meant that. Like it really had all of those elements of just, you know, waxing poetic and just sitting around and talking about the things that we, we loved. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so, so with those, uh, those sessions with, with, uh, with Kevin Smith in the writer's room and, and, and doing all that, um, were there any ideas that were thrown around that didn't ultimately make it into the show itself that you had to kind of leave on the floor? Oh, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think if there was any like great things we did not get to. There were things that we we said, Ooh, let's, let's move that into in, you know, if we get a, a follow-up, let's move that into the follow-up. That's, that's what we'll build to. And, and, okay. and those things, those things, we, we do build to some of those things. Um, trying to remember if there were any, like, I know there was, there was a couple characters that we initially talked about being in the show that, that never made it. I don't think Manny faces, there was a, there was a Manny faces beat that never made it in. Um, Alina was a late, mm. a late uh, sort of cut cut for time. Really, just there was a scene we wanted to get Tila on her on her journey quicker, and there was a scene where she sort of like met up with Alina, who in a lot of ways was Tila's replacement. Right after yeah, Tila yeah. after Tila left, you know, Alina moved into that role as sort of captain of the guards, and and um, Tila had sort of like a a meeting that gave her like the state of the state. And, and it didn't, it didn't ultimately do anything for the audience. And, and we just wanted to get Tila into her, into her story quicker. Um, but yeah, no, I don't think really any, any big ideas that were left in fact, just the, just the opposite. We kept, we kept finding more things to sort of zhuzh. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest after the entirety of, of the scripts were written, right. Or, or, or I think maybe the first, the two thirds were written. Dia's idea of having this sort of like, you know, after in the absence of, of Skeletor, uh, some of his minions who were primarily tech based, right? Mm -hmm. Like God and Triclops and, right. and would, would sort of like, what would, what would they think like in that moment? Like, okay, we've lost how many times, how many times have we lost? And this last time, now that magic is leaving the world, it's magic's fault. Skeletor was so preoccupied with magic, all that shit. Let's just deal with what we know, what we can control, and that's technology. And Dia came up with the idea that they they sort of built a new religion of, around technology, and that they you know worshipped at the altar of motherboard and 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 all of this. And I was like, oh man, that's that's really cool. I I really like this idea. And I called Rob one day. I'll never forget this phone call. I called Rob one day. I said, you know, motherboard sounds like the name of a, of a Motu figure. Like, like, you know, <laughs> off, you know like, like whiplash, like motherboard. Like it sounds like a, like a, like a, a Motu figure. And I said, wouldn't it be really cool if they, we think they're all worshiping this, this false idol, this, this yeah. entity. What if there was really something in there? What if something was really there? And at the time, the 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 effigy the effigy of of Screech wasn't mm -hmm. part of the show. It was, okay. it was it was just like this techno formed version of the of the um, throne room. And and I said, what if they actually had an altar that they were worshiping, like like a golden calf? Because I mean, we had so yeah. many we had so many religious references. And I mean, He Man literally has like a messianic sacrifice. He gets stabbed. yeah yeah the spear like i mean there's so many like you know religious allegories in there but we like what if they like were worshiping like a, a golden calf and i said i'm gonna i'm gonna pitch something to you rob now just go with me here <laughs> when i was a kid when i was a kid 
I used to take apart, you know, you used to be able to like slide off the wings of your Zor and Screech, the rubber part of it. And I said, I used to slide that off and I used to put those rubber wings on my Evelyn figure. And I said, she was like a dark sorceress, like a, like a thing. I said, what if motherboard is actually a robot sorceress and she's transformed as Screech? And Rob was like, what? And I was like, so what if like Screech is the big, is the big altar. And then at the very end, you know, they think that, you know, we think like they're that, that Screech, that it's just a, a bird, but it's actually, there's, there's an entity in there. Well, we, I pitched that to Rob loved it. Kevin loved it. Eric Carrasco loved it. They all loved it. And they, and, and then it just went on this like crazy, crazy thing. But it was like one of those, one of those things where I was like, you know, that thing that when I was a kid, that that's how that influenced this. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I think all of us brought a little bit of that to it. I know that when, when the, the teaser first came out with the, that was cut to Bonnie Tyler's holding out for a hero. So. Which was had, fantastic, by the way, that was, <laughs> good, that was such a good cut. <laughs> the marketing, the marketing team had a bunch of different, um, you know, like 80 songs in there. Okay. And I said, all right, look, when I was a kid, I used to have all my toys laid out on the rug and I was playing the Footloose soundtrack in the background. And I would like, I saw like a musical of He-Man, like, (laughs) and I, and I sent that to my marketing team and I said, what about this? And Jean, who is our, our marketing executive, he called me back. He was like, Teddy, that, that just works. And it had just the right. (laughs) just the right wink like it was it was a little campy but at the same time still a little badass and it yeah. and it just it just did what we needed it to do but again it was like okay when i was a kid like these these toys had such a profound effect on me and those memories were so baked in that being able to do things like that was just such a you know it was like a dream come true when when i say things like that it's not it's not like this pithy like oh it's a dream come true sure, no sure. it was a literal dream come true and you know it's just those kinds of moments it's like that those rarely happen awesome um do you remember what some of those other song choices that you guys were considering <sighs> for that for that teaser I bet if I went through my emails, I could find them. I bet if I, I could find them. Um, I want to say one of them was the final countdown. Dun, 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 dun. But, yeah. but I, I think that was one of them, but I think it was going to be really expensive. Um, <laughs> um, was one of them, one of them was a kiss song. I got. I, I. I bet I could find them for you. I don't remember them cool, off the top cool. of my head. There was only. There was like three. There was like three songs, and they were all good. They were all like, like, you know. I was a little bit of a hesher when I was a kid, so I like, sure. I like, I like heavy metal music, and I was like, yeah, it's fucking good. <laughs> but then, but, but it was the Bonnie Tyler song that just like it just came together. I loved it. Um, it brought back a very specific memory back on like old VHS days. We rent movies from the from the video store and stuff like that. But I remember. There was like this super cut of multiple like different movies, action movies, like all cut together. There was like Harrison Ford's The Witness. There was, you know, Clear and Present Danger, like things like that. But they were all cut together, this big action montage of a trailer. Awesome. But it was set with that song. And so, I mean, that's always been like a fun memory for me. I, I loved that that weird trailer I mean, that was attached to VHS tapes. That whole soundtrack from Footloose is amazing. It's an it's amazing good. soundtrack. <laughs> um, and then we got to use Footloose at, in Umbrella Academy. <laughs> <season three. laughs> I was very excited about that when they said, oh, no, no, we're, we're going to do the entire Footloose dance. And I was like, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so now, kind of going back to this idea of the rise room because that that's just such a cool thing to think about as you guys pitching all these ideas and coming up with all these ideas um are there any like are there any insights or let me rephrase it let's talk about adam and tila because that's what i want to talk about because i i love adam and tila and i love their relationship and i love where you guys are seemingly taking it um 
that relationship is, is seems very central to to what's going on with revelation so oh, in the yeah. writer's room and, and revolution by the way yes um <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> uh so 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 when you're when you're in the writer's room and you're you're talking about these things and you're wanting to to make these ideas clear to the audience do you have any insights about about some of those conversations and yeah it very very specific the the first the first thing, I mean, there's a really, there's a reason, there's multiple reasons why the show is called Revelation, right? Obviously, it was an allusion to, you know, the biblical story of Revelation. This right. is end times, you know, dead rising, heaven's fall, like the, you know, the resurrection of the hero. Like, I mean, it, it's it's all, it's, I mean, we thought we were a little on the nose, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to call the show Revelation? I was like, well, about it it works on a lot of levels i was like you know tila finds like the revelation of her destiny the revelation of the person that she's you know been in love with and her best friend and like all it, it all makes sense and it's sort of like this big epic you know revenge of rise of evil and the return of the hero and he was and and everybody just seemed to really embrace the the title but the it started off with this idea that tila was tila was the only one of adam's core that mm -hmm. did not know that he was he-man right and and his and his father mainly and we, we had two different dynamics there you have the father who wished adam was more of he-man you're right he was always disappointed in adam he was always a little let down by him but he wished he was more like he-man he even said that in filmation many many times so right. did Tila, by the way they would constantly compare adam to he-man and and Tila, who adam was truly her best friend right it was they had a very very almost sibling relationship but there was always there was always something you know deeper there and then it was also alluded to in countless sources that tila had a thing for he-man right and in all of the shows when i was a kid right all of them he-man gem um the you know the idea of a secret identity even on she-ra with you know with seahawk being in love with adora and mm -hmm. bo being in love with she-ra like there was there was always this thing that the person who was in the middle who had these i this identity issue was deceiving the person that cared about them or that they cared about and we had a real maybe a 21st century discussion about that, that a relationship built on a lie does not stand. Yeah. And it's fine to acknowledge that Tila and Adam had feelings for each other and all that, but they never, we never wanted to start that with them as a couple because truly a couple that was built on the foundation of a lie between them, that Tila did not truly know who Adam was, wasn't a strong relationship. We had to get to that place. That moment at the end when she grabs his hand and says, my hero, that is the moment of there is an acknowledgement that they care about each other beyond just the friendship, beyond just the infatuation. And all of those, those hurdles, those walls that had been built up, whether they were, however, however earnest and, and well-intentioned those walls were. And nobody is saying that Adam's a bad person. In fact, right. Taylor even says that when she's in the Wind Raider, she says, I know why you did it. I can't say it didn't hurt anybody, but I understand why you did it. And, mm -hmm. and I think that that was really important for, Tila to understand that he did it to protect her. He yeah. did it to protect her. She knew that, but it still hurt. And that's, that's real life. That's what happens to people. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we really wanted to do is, is we wanted to treat all of these characters in these, in these heightened fantasy situations with real human actions and reactions. And I think that, you know, a lot of people did not like that. And, and I, I acknowledge it. I acknowledge that, People did not want to see Tila feel that way. I get it. I get how how it's con it's confrontational and it's it's not fun and it it is it's painful. I get all that. The intention was to layer in those emotions and it and we wanted it to hurt a little bit mm -hmm. because the payoff. We 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 knew where we were going. Yeah, that's the thing. We knew where we were going. The audience didn't know where we were going. Right. And the fact that we had to split it up between two seasons, between two, two, you know, batches, 
I think got in the way of a lot of people just going along for the ride and getting to, to that moment where it was all earned. And, and that, that was part of a little bit of the reaction to the show is that people, they didn't like seeing Tila angry, hurt, um, you know, protected and, and, and self, you know, self-reliant and, they wanted to see Tila and Adam together. They want to see He-Man right. and Tila fight side by side. I get yeah. that. That's great. We we wanted to earn that. We wanted to get them to, we wanted to, to complicate their relationship at the beginning, a relationship that's been built on 130 episodes of a television series and, you know, 47 mini comics and, you know, <laughs> 13 <laughs> issues of, or 12 issues of, of a, you know, Marvel star comics. And we wanted to, we wanted to complicate that relationship and get to a place where we can earn their future together. And that's, you know, I get it. It, it. it was, it was a emotional reaction to something. And, you know, that was, but we, we had those conversations. We said, we can't have them be a couple at the beginning of this relationship because, you know, that would actually make it even worse. That would make it even worse. Yeah. Yeah. You find out that your, you know, your husband is, is leaving a, a double life. Like right. that's like marriage. That's right on that like that's exactly exactly so we, we we couldn't we couldn't do that we had to get them to a place where all of the walls were down and now they can see each other for who they really are and that's really and, and adam can look at tila as more than just that girl who was confident and self-assured and sure you know she was the captain of the guards he can see her for a woman who is now grappling with her destiny and that is and if anyone can relate to that it's Adam. And that is what the whole thing was building towards. And we explore that in revolution. But I think it's the, you know, it, it's this, this moment of we, we had to get them to a place where they, where they, you know, could see each other for who they really were. So all of that was discussed. It was all, all baked into the show. Did, was it, were there enough scenes that, that dramatize that? Maybe not. Maybe we could have added a couple more scenes. We only had a certain number of episodes and we only had a certain right. number of time. And right. there was a lot of plot to get through. So <laughs> we don't think we, I, I'll be personally honest. I don't think we, there was anything in the show that violated what I just said. I think right. all of that is support. I think the show supports what I just said, but could there have been more scenes to dramatize that? Of course, if we had 12 episodes, if we had 15 episodes, sure, of course. Yeah. You know, it's always, it's always the balance of how much time do you have and how much story can you tell in that time? And you're going to see it in revolution too. We have, you know, Mark Twain once said, um, I, I would have made it shorter if I had more time. Like, you know, there's, <laughs> there, there's the best stories somehow are told in great condensed form. But I also know that people like to spend time with these characters and they like to see them and they, they like to go on these journeys. I personally will never watch the theatrical versions of Lord of the Rings. I will only watch the extended versions because right. I love like spending all that time, even though I true as a, as someone who, who works in entertainment and knows, you know, the economy of storytelling, I know that those theatrical ones get you from point A to point B and a lot quicker and, and keeps the pace and it's exciting and it's got all that stuff. But I like to spend more time with those characters. So I will only watch the extended versions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, going back to the, to what you're saying about, you know, this, this lie between Adam and Tila, you know, I think, I think it's a wise choice that you approached it with that level of, of uh, insight and, and, you know, taking the time to, to consider those, those realistic feelings that are attached to these kind of things, you know, um, Tila as the kind of person she is, if she were to, you know, be told, you know, that Adam is, is he man and he's been keeping the secret from her. I don't see any scenario where she takes that well, <laughs> you know, it's true. It's true. and I think, I think, I think the way she handles it now it's it's coupled with the fact that she had to take it while grieving the loss of yes. those people. So of yes. course, and by the way, none of us are at our best when we are in grief. Nope. None of us. We are all at literally the worst place of our lives when we've lost mm -hmm. someone dear to us. Couple that with losing someone dear to us and and having been 
made the fool and and yeah, yeah. Not, n not being trusted enough to be a part of those conversations like i mean t that that by the way is pulled right out of the the filmation show where tila wasn't trusted enough to go on certain missions you know but right. father i want to go no girl you'll stay back here and you'll do what i told you and of course mm -hmm. she does it anyway and that has always been part of tila's journey is that she's always been over eager to be a part of the things that she wasn't that she wasn't invited to and i think that you know we had to level that up because she was leveling up but we also needed to keep the the truth of the of the dynamic the essence that, of it yeah that is the essence of the way he-man and tila and adam and and man at arms all dealt with each other we had to just sort of like age it up a little bit but it but it's still that dynamic so it you know i think some of the unfair criticism is that you know it's not motu and i'm like well but it really is. When was mm -hmm. the last time? When was the last time you watched like Father Like Daughter? Like when was the last time you've watched? You know, like there are certain certain episodes that that are very explicit in that, and it's it's like we we really tried to maintain that kind of dynamic while while softening up the edges and getting them to a place where they are more more whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, with a person like Adam who is you know, a pure soul who is a good person, you know, I never, I, I don't see any scenario where he uses his, his uh, role as He-Man to his own benefit. You know, there's so many times where he could have, you know, raised himself up in his father's eyes. He could have raised himself up and Tila, he could have got with Tila and be like, no, I'm actually He-Man. Yeah. I'm the guy that you're in love with. You know, let's do this thing. That's not Adam. You know, Adam is a, an honest person, a pure person. And that is also the hardest kind of character to dramatize. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, in, in, in 130 episodes of Filmation, there are very few episodes that deal with He-Man or Adam as a character. Right. And, you know, He-Man literally comes in, in, in most episodes, he comes in to solve a problem or to fix something, and then he leaves. Mm -hmm. There is very little complexity in He-Man, with, with the exception of the problem with power, which, which is a masterpiece. It Absolutely. is a masterpiece of what, what, does that, what does that sort of responsibility mean to Adam and to He-Man? And I think that it was, it was crafted so well, so well, that it inspired a lot of how we looked at Adam in, in our series. Um, and I think that that is, you know, that that's part of the challenge with with a character like Adam, who is so pure. It's, you, you know, there's there's very little place for them to to be um, uh, imperfect. And yeah. I think that that's what people like to watch is they like to watch people overcome their their challenges. And Adam doesn't really have many challenges. The one challenge he had is that the people people saw him as less than. But right. we all knew who we were. I think when there was, there was a, 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 there's been quite a few documentaries, but there was one time when Mattel was meeting with a bunch of different fans at, I think it was PowerCon or, or maybe San Diego. And they had asked, you know, what, what is it about He-Man that you love? And I said, well, look, I said, I think when you're a kid, everybody sees you as a kid. Mm -hmm. But deep down inside, you you may want to believe you may believe in your heart of hearts that you've got more to offer. That if they just listen to you, if they just let you do the things that you know in your heart you can do, you would you would surprise them. You they would you know they would be proud of you. That's Adam, and that's and and that's why kids connect to Adam because yeah. secretly deep down inside, we are the most powerful man in the universe. And, and we are just, but we're just kids and nobody takes mm -hmm. us seriously. What a beautiful, relatable character dynamic. And it yeah. works so well um, in, in a story like that for kids. The, the challenge is how do, you, <laughs> how do you take that as, and as you're telling a story for adults? Right. Where, where, do you, where do you show the cracks? And, and I think that that's part of, you know, again, what people wanted to see. They may have wanted to just see Adam being Adam and turning into He-Man and He-Man saving the day. And if you take a step back, He-Man is in Revelation, the full 10 episodes, proportionally about the same as he'd be in one episode of Filmation. Yep. 
Like we we actually went back like before the show and we said that we're like, is there enough He Man in here? And we're like, <laughs> if you watched an episode of Filmation, He He Man's in it about maybe one sixth, one you know, one one fifth, maybe let's say a third. Let's just be really generous. Um, and of the ten of the ten episodes, you know, He Man is is prominent in in all of the first episode, all of the last episode, and sprinkled in throughout. And the spirit, the more importantly, is the spirit, the way people talk about He Man. Yeah. yeah. Whether it's Evelyn and Teal as they're walking through the the woods, or whether when they're on the the the, the hull of the boat and they're talking about it, or whether whether they're in Preternia and and talking about it together. Like the way people talk about He Man keeps him alive and i think you see that this is a story where you know and i've i've seen all 10 of those episodes a hundred times how many times i have to watch rough cuts and <laughs> and every time orko flicks that sword out of out oh, of it's so him, good and he grabs it every <sighs> time colt i get chills because i know i my hero's back and yeah. it's that but but in order to get those chills, you had to keep him away for a while. Mm -hmm. You had to build to that moment when he grabs that sword. And that's the that's the part that you're you're waiting for. You're waiting for it. You're waiting for it. But you gotta click up the roller coaster before you can get to the to the drop. And that, that's the part that it that I think, you know we had to split it. We had to split yeah. the season. Yeah. And, it, and, and I know how that looks. If we would have put them all together and people would have watched all 10 episodes, you would have, you would have felt the ride of the roller coaster the way that it was written. Right. You know, and I'm glad you say that because that's, that's a thought that I have had, you know, in watching these old episodes um, of He-Man and, and seeing that, you know, it's a lot about building up to this problem. And then he comes in at the end to save the day as the hero and I was always curious, I wonder what the breakdown of that is, you know, on average, if it, if it lines up, you know, close. And, and so it's, it's neat to hear that you guys were th thoughtful about that and, and, and thinking about that, you know, but also that's the exciting thing about He-Man is watching it and waiting. Okay. When is Adam going to run off and, and pull the sword out? When is he going to go become He-Man? And as a kid, I remember when he would, you know, assume the pose and he would reach back and pull the sword out from behind his, you know, where he had it concealed. The sound of his sword sliding out of the sheath was something that was just so yeah. exciting to me as a kid. And I felt that excitement. Like you said, I had, you know, I had chills. I was, it was three in the morning when I was watching part <laughs> two. And I jumped off of my couch and was cheering. Thankfully, I didn't wake up my, my wife or my kids, but, but I felt that excitement. Like he was back. He's and back. I think that's the thing, you know, when he does it in episode one and when he does in episode 10, those moments matter, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a, you know, I, one episode of Familiar, I forget which one it was. He, he turns to He-Man three times and it's like, yeah. like, like we want it to matter. And if you do it so much, it doesn't matter. And that's, and, and to be perfectly honest, when, when you see Revolution, He-Man is in Revolution, the whole thing. Like it's, it's, there's He-Man. But the idea that like, you know, the the moments of transformation need to be important they need to turn the tide if it if they just if he just comes in and you know sweep something under the rug he's not he man he's not mm. the hero and i think we, you have to have you have to give weight and importance to those moments and in the first episode we know that the tide is going to change like this is he's got a skeletor is in grayskull he is about to do something really effing bad it matters. Yeah. At the end, all hell is breaking loose. <laughs> the worst person to have the sword has the sword, and she's literally like she's undoing reality. <laughs> like she's yeah, lost it. <laughs> it is all tips are down, bets are off. Here comes He Man. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know there was a line where He Man says, um, when Skele Skeletor, okay, so Teela and Evelyn are fighting and it's all crazy. And Teela is, um, she's going off and they're, they're doing things. And Skeletor is like, you're going to fight me now. And he's like, what are you doing? It's not about us. And I know a lot of people were like, oh, see, it's not about He-Man. It's that line. Uh. Very specific. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'm not defensive, but I'm just going to say one thing. When I was a kid and in the 1987 movie, when he-Man says, it's not her you want, it's me. It's always been between us. It makes the world so small. 
Yeah. In my point of view, He-Man is the hero for now. Skeletor is the hero for now. Or sorry, Skeletor is the villain for now. This is a massive universe. And what is going on right now is bigger than the than the feud between He-Man and Skeletor. Right. It is it is cosmic. And that's what we really wanted to do with Motu Revelation is take a step back. This is a bigger world, right? It's not called Frodo and the Lord of the Rings. Right. It's the Lord of the Rings. That is what we were trying to show is that this is a universe-wide event that is happening. Yes, we are showing it on Eternia. Yes, it is from the point of view of these specific characters, but this is masters of the universe. That is the brand. That is what it is since 1982. And it has never been allowed to breathe bigger than just He-Man versus Skeletor. And while not discounting He-Man versus Skeletor, that is a part of this. We wanted to show that it could be bigger. And I think that that's, you know, again, do people love that? Did they want to see He-Man versus Skeletor? I get it. I get it. The intention was, let's make this as big as we can possibly make it. Right. Yeah. You know, I I think that's a good moment because I think it's it's one of those moments. And I, I you know, recognize this in the old series. There's moments where He-Man, you know, joins forces with Skeletor for the greater good. You know, there's the evil seed episode, you know, where they're on top of Castle Grayskull with Sorceress and they combine their magic. Yep. You know, that's how I, I viewed this, this kind of, this team up moment between them, you know, and, and He-Man sees the best in people and wants to believe that there's good in people, even Skeletor. He yep. gives him the power. He empowers him to, to be able to, to help him. And I just, I think that's, a good testament to who he is as a character is that he's willing to see the best in people. He's willing to, you know, see Teal and be like, okay, I trust you enough. You go off and fight evil in. I'm going to stay here and keep people safe. Mm -hmm. You know, those are important to the character in, in my opinion. So I don't know. I think that line gets a lot of bad <laughs> flack from people who are, are looking a little bit too much I, into it. I see it though. I see how people can take it that way. Um, and from from our point of view, though, it was really just about showing how big the world could be. And as a direct reaction to that line in the 87 movie, <laughs> that always it always bugged me when I was a kid. I was like, no, I was like, it's not just about you guys. I was like, because then that 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 doesn't make the horde interesting. It doesn't make, you know, the, the elders, the story of the elders interesting or, or any of the stuff that has come since, right? Like there's, right. there's so much bigger universe building here and, and that making it just a, a rivalry, a fun rivalry, a fun, like an amazing iconic rivalry is, is great, but it's, it just minimizes the breadth of storytelling that is inherent in this world. And I yeah. think that, you know, that is, that's what we, what, even before me, it's what, it's what, you know, Ian Richter tried to do in 2000. It's what Rob did in, in, you know, in, in the, the mini comics, Tim Seeley or the, the DC comics with Tim Seeley. Right. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's what Nightlick tried to do with the, with the bios. Like it's, you try to incorporate how big and expansive the world is. And, you know, there's, there's so many stories that have nothing to do with he-man mm -hmm. so many and it's like that that's there's interesting stuff there yeah yeah um so with with revolution coming up um let's kind of go over what what we can talk about about revolution um what we do yeah. know about it so you know nothing. Got, you know, nothing at all <laughs> next question <laughs> no so so <laughs> So we've got five episodes. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen people out there positing forth the idea that there's actually 10 episodes and you guys just aren't saying there's five it's episodes, a, right? Five episode beginning, middle and an end. Five okay. episodes. Okay. Um, another question I see come up, you know, because of the introduction of Hordak, the tease at the end of Revelation, does that mean she is coming? Uh, she is not coming as far as I understand, correct? No. Can you, can you kind of explain why those rights are so messy? Because I have a hard time following... I think everybody kind of has a hard time figuring everybody, this out. <laughs> everybody has an issue with it. And I, I, first of all, I don't, I don't represent 
anything uh, for Mattel or their legal, you know, uh, team. So I cannot talk about anything like that. Gotcha. Um, but they are they are uh, complicated to say the least. Okay. Um, it's a very, uh, from what people have said about it, it's a very He-Man versus Skeletor story. It's the focus is on them. Mm -hmm. um, you you said you know He-Man's in it a lot. Uh, how I'm trying to think of how to. No, I'm not going to ask that. Um, yeah, he man, he man, he man's in it a lot. Um, he's he he's in all, he man's in all five. Of Actually, uh, he man, he man is he man in. He's in half of one, all of two. Ninety five percent of three. He's Adam in four. He man in five. Okay. So he's, Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so going into, you know, the time between the end of Revelation part two and moving forward with more of the story and, and deciding to do revolution. Uh, what does that look like from, from Netflix's perspective and from, you know, my perspective? Well, we, you know, we always judge to see how, how shows do to keep them, keep them going. Um, Revelation did well enough to want to do more. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if Revolution does well, we'll do more. Um, that's that's the way it works. So if if everybody loves it and watches it and demands to see more, and if and in a perfect world, if they go back and they rewatch Revelation or watch Revelation for the first time to get to this, then we're then we're in a great place. Um, and because cool. we we know where we want to go with the with what we're thinking is the final chapter. Mm -hmm. um, we all know where we want to go, and it's pretty freaking cool so i get really excited thinking about it so yeah oh, cool 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 so revelation did did great didn't uh you know like you said it was successful it warrants more um i think that's that's good for for fans to to know you know it's also um, i mean it, it takes a long time to make animation i, I mean mm -hmm. I, I guess i guess a lot of people think that you know it, it happens very quickly we so quick timeline right okay take about 20 weeks of writing, right? 20 weeks of writing from breaking the season, coming up with outlines for each of the episodes. Maybe maybe you'll do one, one version of each outline, but then each script gets maybe three or four versions of each script before they're, they're locked. Um, and then, then you start recording. So we, we started recording Revolution like last year. Um, okay. And you rec you, we were recording... Um, all the actors before you start animation, right? Uh -huh. so all the actors record episode one before you start animation. You animate to the voice acting. Okay. So then, then it takes about, you know, animation's the longest part. You get animatics. You get two versions of each animatic where they're like storyboarded to the voice actors. So they set up the shots and then we're making sure that like, oh, no, 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 we have to be on He-Man for that moment. That's, that's his realization moment. We have to be on him for that. Oh, no, wait, wait. The action in that sequence isn't as great. Let's, let's you know, put Tila up on that mountain piece and let's do that. Like those are the kinds of things that you, you note in the first animatic. You get them to the second animatic. You make slight little tweaks. Then you send that off to animation. Animation takes about 11 months okay it takes forever we Man. literally just got the first pass of animation on episode two and there's a lot of things you know sometimes what happens when you see animation where like the wrong person is speaking out of the wrong character's mouth or you know something is colored differently or um you know where they they look off model uh, those are the things you start to flag in a first pass animation and then you call retakes those retakes take just as long right okay just as long and then once all those retakes are done and you get another version of it and you're looking at it and it's like okay that's all great you may make a couple of smaller tweaks then it goes into post that's when they add all the lighting effects and the visual effects and all the stuff and that you know, make it look really really poppy and cool then then you go into com composition so the you know bear starts he starts doing his music compositions then they go into a uh 
processing, which is like, um, like we call it sweetening, but it's like, that's where you mix all the levels of the music and the dialogue and the, and the sound effects and all that stuff. And then you get it to a place where it's all polished. And then you do a, a final color pass where you adjust all the different colors where, you know, you'll pull the background color up a little bit or pull down a little bit and you do all of that stuff. And that's when you get to final, that takes about two years, each wow. episode, two years. So, and it's on a row, it's on a rolling schedule. So you know, you start episode one here, you get to a certain place over here, then you come in with episode two, then you start moving there, then you come in in episode three. So they're all on a rolling schedule. So that's why these mm -hmm. things forever. That's why the second half did not launch with the first half is that we, we knew it was going to be a little later than we wanted to launch, but we knew that the kids show had to launch in, in the fall okay. and in September. Um, and we were like, do we hold all 10 episodes until after the kids show or do we, you know, split it up and do half and half. And, you know, we, we made a call. We said, well, there's a really big cliffhanger in the middle. <laughs> 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 I mean, maybe we do split it up. Um, should I go back in time? <laughs> where, is my, where is my cosmic key? Um, should I go back in time? <laughs> I'm not a torquedum, you know. Nice <laughs> <laughs> that didn't store its home coordinates. Uh, I would have been able to go back and put all ten episodes together. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Um, so, do you have a uh, you know? And obviously, if you if you can speak to it, do you have a potential timeline that you're looking at for for the release of Revolution? Not yet. Not yet. Again, because it's still so early in the in the animation process, um, we'll have a better and because, you know, it's not just Motu. Like Netflix has a ton of other things and it has to fit in the the timeline, right? It's got to right. all fit together. So once we start to see when when the realistic time that we can have all of the episodes done, then we start to look at um, you know, how how it all fits into the the bigger strategy gotcha. for movies. Not okay. Um, all right. Well, I know, you know, we've talked about this in our messages before, but when Revolution releases, I'm going to be bugging you constantly as I'm watching that show. <laughs> I'm going to be sending you messages. I'm going to be talking yeah. to you. There are moments, there are moments <sighs> in there where I am like, oh, that's for Cole. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> there are I'm just, oh, you're going to love that. Um, Look, to think that we we did not hear the fans after Revelation is is just it's just not true. We did. We yeah. we 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 still know what we want to do with the show and the story we want to tell, but we also know what fans want to see. So I think that there is a a real union of all of that in Revolution. Um, so I think that I I think that people will be surprised. Cause that's the goal we, you know, that's, it's really hard to surprise people anymore. And, and, you know, with, in the world that we live in now, everything's spoiled and I, <laughs> to, to its credit, the twists in, in Motu were not truly spoiled, but they were misinterpreted a lot of times yeah. as, 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 you know, as for misleads or, or things. I still want to surprise the audience. I still want to introduce characters that they that they never thought they would see in animation or that they never thought would would factor into a story like this or you know I still want to take the what people perceive as you know a fait accompli about why a character does a certain thing and introduce an element that based based on you know core mythology mm -hmm. takes to a different place right I think there's there's stuff in every iteration of Motu that I'm like, eh, I don't like that. You know, every everyone. There's stuff in, in Filmation sure. that I'm like, eh, I don't like that. There's stuff in the yeah. mini comics I'm like, eh, I don't like that. Um, there's tons of stuff in the bios that I'm like, I don't like that. Um, <laughs> I So there, there's stuff in every version of Motu that, that we don't like. Yeah. But I, 
I think the entirety of the experience of seeing our characters and seeing them be the characters that we know them to be and see them, you know, do things that are surprising and fun. And, you know, I think, I think Mark is wonderful as Skeletor. I think, I think Lena is, she is my evil in. I love her to pieces. And by the way, I don't know if I, I don't know if anybody knows this, but she was a massive fan of Masters in the Universe when yeah. The first time we recorded her, she came into the studio. It was with Mark. This was pre-COVID. She came into the studio with Mark, and she was like, I always wanted to play Evelyn. And Kevin was shocked. Kevin was like, you know who Evelyn is? And she goes, yes, Kevin. I, too, was once a child. Um, <laughs> she, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of her performance, you know, in the earlier episodes, really, like, Tim was so inspired by her and he would go back and he would just like juice up her dialogue more, like give her more things to chew on. She just delivered it so well. And, you know, and Chris, Kevin was just like, guys, I know who our He-Man is. And, and we were like, who? And he's like, Chris Wood. And I'm like, okay, that guy, that's my, that's my He-Man. When I close my eyes and hear him, like it was John Irwin most of my life. Sure. Sure. Not hear Chris Wood now. And it's yeah. like, there is there is a, a such a charm to his voice, and and he's so he's so good at differentiating between Adam and He Man, and I love that. Um, yeah, we have it, it's it's pretty terrific. And and wait till you wait till you hear our Hordak. Oh, wait till you hear him. And it's not uh, Shatner. I know everybody's like who's Shatner. Everyone, everyone, Shatner. yeah, everyone thinks it's Shatner. I guess I mean you're gonna have to find out, but you know, but, but our Hordak is great too. There's a lot of there's a lot of fun new voices in this, and Hordak is it's good, cool, cool. Do you have um? Do we know when when those uh, announcements are are going to be made? We we had the Tila announcement for um, Melissa. There, yes, uh, that one that one was um, you know, again, all of these people have recorded already. They recorded. Mm -hmm. A year ago, right, um, right. But we hold announcements, right? So uh, there is an announcement coming. I don't know if it's in April. I think it. I think it's in May. Um, there okay. is an announcement coming in May. Okay. Cool. That's exciting. Um, yeah. So Re Revolution is going to release the next time you and I talk with each other on this channel. We're going to be talking a lot about Revolution, and I am. That's going to be a fun conversation. I'm and all the new toys. I want new yeah, toys. So many toys. So many toys. Let's talk about toys. Let's do that. That's a good segue. Um, what's your favorite toy right now for Masters of the Universe? Oh, my favorite Masters of the Universe toy right now. I did just get um, this guy right here. I literally went to, to my target. Um and there he was. There he was. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Our very own dad at arms right here. Um, he is pretty <laughs> I love him. He's like, I think he's entirely new sculpt. And I, I love oh, yeah. Him. And this this um cloak is so good. It's just I just love it. It's the same material that um that's on Scare Glow's cape and, and Andra's sort of cloak, but I, okay. I really just love it on him. It looks so good. Um, it, it, you know what it is? It's the same kind of cloak fabric as like the vintage Kenner Star Wars figures. Like oh, okay, squid, like the Jedi robes and stuff. Like squid head, like like squid head's cape. That's what it reminds me oh, of. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so that's that's right now. I do. I will say I love the the new Shadow Weaver. Mm -hmm. This came out. I think she's. I think she's magnificent. I think she may be the best Shadow Weaver that we've had. Okay. The one, the original one in in classics, as much as I'm looking, I, I'm looking at it. Uh, the original one in classics, as much as I, I remember the feeling, the emotional feeling of actually having a shadow weaver figure in my hand. But now that I look at it, it's like a shampoo bottle. Like it's the relation <laughs> is so so awful. I mean, the sculpt is gorgeous because the four horsemen can do no wrong. Um, but the articulation and just the engineering in it is just so like. Meh. Um, yeah. but this new one, the, the one from, uh, Masterverse is so good. And there's some really great stuff coming in, in Masterverse. I'm very excited to get that clamp champ. 
Um, I'm very excited. Oh my god, the the new Eternia Whiplash looks incredible, and it has all that, that um, like the the helmet and the torch inspired by like his original like design yeah. that they, they did of him. Like, I love that. Um, those are pretty cool. I literally just got my, my frog monger. I love him. Um, I have, I have my, my new wave with slammer eye and, uh, 2000X Randor, um, at, in my pile of loot at big bad toy store. So mm -hmm. with that, um, yeah, there's so, there's so much stuff coming. Um, I've seen, I've seen the, the final pictures of, of snake mountain and they look amazing. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, and then all the stuff that's coming for revolution. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot. Despite, despite rumors to the contrary, right. there is more stuff coming. Good, so. good, good, good. Yeah. Seems like the line is doing just fine. No end in sight. I was at Target yesterday and, and look, it's true. The, the velocity of, of sales is, is not there. It's, it's slow. Every toy line is slow right now. I don't know. I don't know. Like you cannot look at, there has been the same Ironhide, you know, Transformers Legacy Ironhide sitting on my target for probably six months. It is, it just yeah. has not moved. Like there's just like, things just aren't selling as fast as they used to. But when I was at Target yesterday, when I got, when I got this guy, um, there was three, two bads, um, two Shadow Weavers and a, and a, a movie He-Man figure and and three of these and i bought three of the, i bought all three of these uh one for me to open one for me to keep sealed and one for tim sheridan because yeah um, because when i see those things i have to get them for him because tim awesome. he's tim uh tim rarely buys himself toys um yeah. so i have to buy them for him because i i'm an enabler <laughs> tim's so much fun i love talking to tim he's the best he's wonderful the best mm. Um, why, you know, kind of leaning up to, to concluding this interview, but, but when it comes to masters of the universe, and I ask this question to, to most of the guests that I have on, um, why do you think it has such a lasting appeal? It's a great question. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of things have been inspired by Motu for sure. Um, I think, at the time, it was one of the very first fusions of fantasy and sci-fi. Like, I, it's it's hard to think, you know. I mean, I technically think Star Wars is a fusion of fantasy, of magic and and science fiction sure. forces, if nothing yeah. else, magic. Um, but I do think that Motu really put like a a spotlight on science and sorcery. Like, it was the two things. Um, and I think, you know, giving credit to all of those guys the, to mark taylor to you know rudy abrero to uh roger sweet to you know all of these the guys who invented this stuff you know paul cleveland like all these guys that that crafted this world and the imagination that they had it is incredibly imaginative and we live in a world right now where a lot of things are very grounded and if if you can't see it, then it's probably not it's probably not accessible. And I think that we I love I love the imagination. I love going to places that I can't go to on this world. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's why that's why Star Wars endures. That's why you know um, it's it's why things like you know Harry Potter took off so well. There's there's big swaths of imagination and. Motu's got it. The challenge with Motu, there is a challenge with it though, is that there is no one unified story the way there is with Star Wars or the way there is with Harry Potter. Um, there, there have been many, many stabs at it. And I think that what, what I'd love to be able to say is that that's its strength. That is its strength is that, is that Motu is a, it is a palette of colors for artists to paint with. And you you can like them all and they can all be different and they can all have different points of view and they can all be saying different things and they can all take you to different, you know, on different rides and they, and they're all valid. They're, you know, it, it's like, I love Batman, the animated series in mm -hmm. my mind, it is the definitive Batman. 
I hear Kevin Conroy. When I hear Batman, when I read a Batman comic, I hear Kevin Conroy. It is the right. definitive. But I love Adam West. I love the 60s Batman. Michael Keaton is my Batman. Yeah. I like like I remember, you know, being a kid going to the theaters to see Batman. They're all very different. And this one, you know, the Joker kills Batman's parents, you know, and it's like that that's not canon. That didn't happen. But you, right. you know, for the story, it worked. It worked for the story. And I went with it and I loved it. And and I can, as an adult, I can say that's the Keaton Batman. Mm -hmm. And I love all those McFarlane. 66 toys that are coming the fact that i'm getting a bat boat the fact that i'm getting a king tut figure like it's like what <laughs> what and it's like i love them and i love that but but it's like i also know that what bruce tim and eric radomsky and and paul dini and you know kevin altieri and all those guys did on batman animated series it's perfect. Like that is, that's great. But it doesn't mean I don't love the sixties Batman for sure. what the 60s Batman is or what the Keaton movies are for Keaton movies and the Nolan movies. I love, I love the dark Knight masterpiece movie, mm -hmm. but like they can all exist. And that's what I think Motu strength is. The challenge though, is that, you know, he man is not that man. He does. He has not had a, movie franchise that has gone through multiple reboots he has not had you know comics running for you know 70 80 years he has not had multiple 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 animated series every other year so you know if, if there's a batman that comes out that you don't like don't worry there's another one coming in a couple months like right. he can have that so every one that comes out matters and it has to have has all this pressure to be the thing right and i and i think that that's it's both it's both sad and and a blessing because we can enjoy them for what they are and and if we stop putting the responsibility that they have to carry the burden of masters of the universe for the rest of, it, of existence every one that comes out it, we can we can just allow them to be what they are and enjoy them um mm -hmm. and, see, and see them for what they are and i think that that's you know, that's it's it's the thing that I love about it. And also the thing that is the, the hardest as as somebody who makes content, I see the challenges there. And, sure. I, and I think it's yes, great. We can do all these things. We can you know, we can make a point of difference between the filmation by saying Orko was great in his home world. But he, but in our version, he he was just as challenged in his home world as he is on Eternia. We can make that distinction and say, well, that's our version for this. Mm -hmm. But it's you know, it is. People are like, no, that's Orko. And if you're going to do that now, it's, ah, it's it's hard. It's really hard. So I can imagine. Um, coming from your fan perspective now and to the point where you are now where you've been able to add your you know, influence on Masters of the Universe with Revelation and, and Revolution... How does that, how does that feel? Um, humbling is the word. I am, um, I am grateful that I'm going to get, I'm going to get a little emotional. I am grateful that I had the opportunity to be a part of this, however small, however insignificant it is. It's the thing that I love the most. And the fact that I was able to, to come into this world and play with other people who also loved it as much as I did is the most rewarding thing that I've ever been a part of. And, I, and I've done some really great things. I've won Emmys. Like the fact that I was able to, to come into this and, and love it and, and give it love. I know it wasn't what everybody wanted, but I do think we all came from a place of love for this. Um, and it is very humbling, but, I am a temporary custodian of this brand and I will, I, it will go off to someone else and someone else will do something with it. And, and I will be with everyone else watching that and enjoying it or not enjoying it or seeing how it is. And, and for this time that I've been a part of it, I'm very grateful and very humbled. And I, you know, I look forward to whoever does something new with it next. And, you know, I am, 
I am a part of, of great people who have had the opportunity to do this, right? Like Ian, like Ian Richter, I go, I go back to Ian Richter who, you know, he, he did such a wonderful job with the 2000 X series. I, I think, and he's also just a nice guy and, and, you know, he, he did some really great things and, you know, and Ian is the same thing. Like he, he stepped aside and somebody else took over. Right. And mm -hmm. That's that's what happens. That's what happens. And you can make a, a small contribution to this, right? And 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 I can look back and say, oh, motherboard is a thing that that I had a part in, right? That would that's yeah. really cool. That's cool. Um, and you know, some people may not like motherboard. I get that. I get that. But you know, I mean, like Paul Dini came in and he and Bruce Tim created Harley Quinn. Right and now, she's got a life of her own. She's gonna be played by Lady Gaga. What? <laughs> but it's like you know, and they had a part of it. But other people have come in, and Christopher Nolan came in and did Batman, and then Matt Reeves did Batman. And it, mm -hmm. you, you can, you can pass the torch, and you can be a part of that, and you can, you can be grateful and gracious and humble and 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 feel like there is a there is a a world that that identifies people who love something can be a part of it. And I think that that's, that's really what, what any of us really hope for. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of great people that have written the comics. There's been, you know, uh, people across, like I look at somebody like, like um, Danielle Galerta, who yeah. is Vance. She was he man.org, like we, we, you known her for years. And, and she got to pick up the bios when the, when the bios started going away. And it's like, and she is a fan and those are the bios. And that's like, that's really cool. And I, I, I called her for some, for some stuff. I'm like, I, I can't find anything. I am racking my brain out to find this thing. I called Danielle, boom, she had an answer in 10 seconds. Like, that's amazing. And, and when Revolution launches and Danielle um, will be surprised by this, uh, will that answer that she had will, will appear. So those, awesome. those are those are things that I, I like to be able to bring other people into this, the world too. So. That's cool. No, it's fun that you, that you bring up Danielle. I just previously um, did an interview with her and with Eric Marshall about their time with, with the bios and they were so fun to talk to such lovely people. Unbelievable. Oh. Lovely. I absolutely adore Danielle. I've actually never met Eric, but um but I, I just, I've known Danielle for years and love her to pieces. So, um, and there, you know, there is a really, really good fan community for Mo too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there, there's been, there was, you know, there's a lot of infighting in every fan, in every fandom. But the fact is, I'm still so grateful to be a part of these fans. And I love, I love this brand and that supersedes everything. Yeah. That's awesome. I think one, one thing that I've learned, you know, as I've been talking to people since I started doing this channel is that so many people were fans first before they started working on Mass of the Universe. You know, we, I've talked with Nate Barge. I've talked with, you know, James E. Talk. I've talked with Yuka. Uh, I've talked with you. I've talked with Tim. You know, just the amount of people who began as fans of Motu and doing fan art and doing just things because their interest interested in it because they wanted to preserve it in their own way and then that evolves into something bigger for them it's just something that's so special and so fantastic to me to know that it's the fans who are driving this brand forward and and that's i mean that's also just a product of where we are right now i, I jokingly say and the geek shall inherit the earth like mm -hmm. we are there we are at that place where you know people who grew up loving you know, loving comics and, and loving, you know, Motu and Star Wars and that like, we're the ones that get to tell those stories now. And, and that's just, that's incredible. It's incredible. And, and, you know, again, I, I'm, I just happen to be blessed to be in this position and, and was able to make this opportunity happen to me. There is, you know, I, I'm not entitled to it. I don't have a right to it as, as a fan, I am just blessed. And I realize that. And I also realize that it's, that it's fleeting and it, it, I, I won't have, I won't be an authority of this. I won't, I'm not going to, you know, 
I'm not going to be able to, to, you know, hold on to this for the rest of my life and, and claim to it. But for now, I'm really grateful to be a part of it. And that's, that's really all, all we have. So. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, you know, I don't think I have any more questions for you, Ted. Um, I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy we were able to do this. I've, I've loved all our conversations that we have. I'm so happy that I, I sent you a message. Um, whenever I sent it, um, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed our conversations and I've enjoyed being your friend and, and I appreciate that. So oh, I just I want to say thank you. I appreciate you. I think it's, I mean, look, that's how things happen, right? Like you just, you reach out and if you're a nice person and you make a connection and you build from there, that's, that's life. That's just, that's all it is. We're just one, one connection away from, from something, you know, something greater, whether it's, whether you meet, you know, somebody who eventually becomes your life partner and you can, you know, have children and, and move, move that story forward, or whether you meet a friend and you can build a professional relationship and, you know, that's, that's how this world works. And it's about kindness and respect. And if everybody has kindness and respect, then that's, that's the world. Absolutely. Yeah. I appreciate you. You're, you've always been wonderful in our chats. Um, I'm sorry that we, that we, that was only a look back and not a look forward. I, I, I cannot, That's okay. re- cannot reveal a lot. So, um, but when, once revolutionaries, I'm sure that we'll have a lot to talk about. Yeah, for sure. I'm looking forward to that conversation. So, and you know, I, I appreciate your position where you're at. I know you can't reveal much, but I wanted to push a little bit and see, see what we could get out of you. But so, well, I, I'm going to, we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up. Where can, uh, oh, re- I mean, real belief that you, where, where can people find you? Tell people where they can find you. Cause you take oh. amazing pictures with your toys. And I think my, people would uh, love to see that kind of stuff. My Instagram is animate Ted. Um, I literally just got my, my Mezco Batman. So there will be pictures coming of this beautiful, beautiful figure um and then I literally have figures like within arm's reach because i'm like oh i've got to take pictures of frogmonger <laughs> i literally just got the casey jones fan of the opera thanks Cole. do you have do you have him in hand he, he's he's downstairs in the kitchen so awesome. um, and uh, that will be that will be taking pictures i got all these the new super seven gi joe's got i mean come on come on look at this guy look at that's that cool. he, he is that so is cool. great he's so great i love them <laughs> um, I, was, I was worried there for Super Seven for a while because a lot of the figures that were coming were were just not um, were not great, right? Like the um, the last wave of Disney figures were just kind of, and I'm and yeah. I was like, man, I'm like, I hope they don't screw up like Silver Hawks and, and GI Joes. Those Silver Hawks figures came in; they are great. GI Joes good. and they're great. So I'm I'm very excited. Look at like I have all these the Thundercats over here right now. Look at. Look at how good awesome. Those. Look at how those good, good. Yeah, that's beautiful. And my, and my thunder tank here. I haven't even opened it yet. That thing is massive. So it, I, big. I have no idea where I'm gonna put that. <laughs> there's there's the Motu side of things over here. Oh, that snake mountain is such a gorgeous piece. I'm I'm still I skipped it because I didn't have the room for it. I barely have room for Castle Grey Skull. It's pretty and big. Man, and then I, I made it's I made this, thing. I made this moat for it. So okay. Like I, I sculpted it and then cast it out of resin. It's like it's hot, translucent, like orange resin for the whole thing. And crafty. You're very crafty. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, man. Well, I think we can go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, this has been the Dad at Arms channel. Thanks for tuning in and listening to Ted Biaselli talk about Master of the Universe Revelation and a little bit about revolution. Um, please, you know, watch, share and like subscribe to the channel that's always fun to see new people come in and yeah so um yeah so we will see you next time uh thanks a lot ted